Hey, church. I want to welcome all of you across the network as we continue in a conversation we started last week, a conversation about prayer and the power of God that's available by His presence. We began that conversation by digging down into the concept of this power by looking specifically at the Greek word that describes it. That Greek word is dunamis. Dunamis, and it's a fun word to say, but it means power, and there's a specific definition that we need to understand to fully live into it. Here's what it says. Dunamis is inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. Dunamis power, and it begins to frame and shape the kind of life we can have in Jesus by his Holy Spirit because of his presence. The presence of God. See, power and presence of God are linked in our lives by prayer. And today, we're going to see how that prayer is linked to a name. One name. Now, if you're returning, having been part of the conversation last week, we're just going to keep rolling along in what we started last week. But if you're just joining us now, I want you to know it's okay. I'll get you caught up here in a second. But I'm really thrilled that you're here. Because prayer is the greatest privilege on earth. Yet we don't always know or understand how to engage it, what it can do, how it all works. Which is one of the reasons why last week we started by understanding that prayer is the link to the power of God and the presence of God in our lives. That as we seek his presence, it's by his presence that he imparts his power when we pray. He wants to give us his dunamis power. He wants to impart that to us by his presence. We know it's available because of what he says in Scripture, but we know he makes it available because he is actually for us. He's for us. God does not give us a spirit of fear in this world, but really one that is marked by power. Not a spirit of fear, but one of power, dunas power, love, and self-control. That is available to us in all the complexity of life. But when when we encounter hard stuff or we encounter sad things or overwhelming things, we can find ourselves in a place where we throw our hands in the air and we just say, I can't do it anymore. I can't forgive again. I can't love them. I can't recover from that. I can't continue. And any time we find ourselves in a space where we're thinking or saying those realities, it's often a good indication, indication that we are no longer living in his power by his presence. And it also indicates often a lack of prayer. Because a lack of prayer leads to a lack of dunamis power. And a lack of dunamis power leads to a lack of results. But as we saw last week, as we looked in Mark 9, Jesus himself said there are just some things that don't happen apart from prayer. Which is why we're trying to understand how we seek his presence in a posture and, and, and practice of prayer so that we can begin to experience God-sized results in our life by his power. And no longer throw our hands in the air saying we just can't do it anymore, but we can actually lift our hands in the air in prayer and praise and ask of God. Ask him to move, ask him to heal, ask him to free. Offer those I can't moments to him in praise and prayer. And he imparts his dunamis power for us to experience the fullness of what he calls us to. Now when I was early in my faith journey, I actually struggled to pray a little bit. Because in my mind, I felt like I had to develop some capacity, some skill, some strength, some power to be able to get into his presence so that I could have the conversation. But that's not how it works. God invites all of us to approach him in prayer where in that space we can begin to experience his presence and his power. But in order to do that, that actually connects to a name. To to pray, to to pray effectively, to experience the power of God in our lives through prayer, there are a couple of hallmarks to that. In, in In order to experience the fullness of what prayer can do, there's a hallmark of persistence. When we, when we persist in pursuing God, we make it a priority to come into his presence. That's a hallmark of effective prayer. When we make it a, a priority, when we pursue his presence as a priority, that's a hallmark of effective prayer. When we come into before him in prayer in, a, in our position, it matters that we come before him humbly and submitted before him. The posture we take as we approach him in prayer matters. It's a, it's a physical posture that matters based on how we kneel or stand or lay out on the ground, but it's also our heart posture that matters. These four things are hallmarks of effective prayer, but so is power. The difference between these four and this one is that we don't establish this. 
We don't develop it. It is not ours to to develop. It's ours to steward because what happens is when we approach God in prayer, we actually are receiving his power. As we persist and we make it a priority, when we sit in the right posture and position, he imparts his power to us, and we need to steward it. And that power that he offers actually connects to authority. See, the the thing that God wants to impart, this dunamis power, there's authority behind it. Power is actually linked to authority, but it's linked by a name, one name, the name that is above all names. The power of God is linked to to a name that reflects the authority that's connected to a who. And the dunamis power of God is only available in the authority of Jesus' name. That's your first feeling if you want to track in your note guide today. That dunamis power is only available in the authority of Jesus' name. Only in his authority, the authority of his name, can we experience the power of God in our life. It's, it's in his name. We've got to know his name. It reminds me, though, of a classic story, uh, one that just warrants telling again once in a while. It's a story of an elderly couple who had some friends over who were also elderly, and they, they had lunch together, and then they decided to go for a walk. And as they were out on the walk, the, the ladies were lingering just a few steps behind the men who were out in front along the path. And the one gentleman turned to the second gentleman and said, you know, we went to a restaurant recently that was just wonderful. It was, it was great food and, and great service. You should really consider going there with your wife. wife it's romantic. And the second gentleman looked back at the ladies who were still in conversation talking about anti-aging cream and Facebook drama. (laughs) But the second man said, that sounds wonderful. Where is it? What's what's it called? What's the name? And the first man paused, and after that pause, he said, you know, I married late in life. I've been married for 50 years, and I've got to admit my memory is not what it used to be, so I need your help with this. What's the name of that fancy flower? The second man said, you mean a lily? No, no, no. I mean the one that women like. Oh, you're talking about an orchid. No, no, no. It's the one that's often red. It's got a stem and has thorns on it, and and men give it to their sweethearts on Valentine's Day. The second man said, oh, you're talking about a rose. First man said, yeah, that's it, rose. Then he turned his head and yelled to his wife, hey, Rose, what's the name of the restaurant we went to last week? (laughs) It's really important to know the name of your spouse. Well, listen, if we're ever going to fully live into the dunamis power of God, it's essential that we know the name of Jesus. It's essential that we know the name of Jesus. Dunamis power is only available in the authority of Jesus' name. Power and presence of God are linked in prayer, but prayer is linked to the name, the name that is above all names. It's a name that comes with authority, a name that marks identity, a name that that has power behind it. And God makes this very clear all throughout Scripture. But there is power in the name of Jesus. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, we can read these words. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. My friends, that is both a promise and an invitation. To call on the name of the Lord and experience his resurrection power in our lives. Dunamis power is only available in the authority of Jesus' name. Now we've talked before about a few of these truths a couple of years ago, but it's a good time to revisit because we're trying to position ourselves to be able to engage the power of God. We're not looking to acquire the power of God, we're looking to engage the power of God. Because when we make a decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, We now have him present in our lives by the Spirit. But he also makes available his power by that same Spirit. But many of us don't know how to engage that power in our lives, and so we end up living lesser lives. And so today we're going to be talking about how we take one step further into understanding how to engage the dunamis power of God out of the name that brings the authority, out of the name of Jesus. And we're going to do that with tons of Scripture, so buckle up. We're going to be in a lot of Scripture today. 
But before we get into that scripture, I want to go back to the definition of dunamis for just one moment. I want to look specifically at these words here. By virtue of its nature. That's that power residing in a thing or a person residing in someone by virtue of their nature. So we're talking about character. We're talking about authority. We're talking about identity. And Jesus, by who he was, who he is, he inherently has power and authority. Inherently. And he offers both of them to us. So that we too can put forth and exert the same power on his behalf in his name. It's awesome. But we need to understand and know how to do that and how to engage. Because there is nothing. There is no value. There is no, there's no purpose. There is no dunamis power apart from his name. Without, without his name, there are implications. Everything is less without his name. But everything is so much more in his name. In the authority of his name. But you don't have to take my word for this. I want to look specifically at a moment in scripture that, that helps us understand and unpack this further. So I invite you to grab your Bible if you've got one and turn to Acts chapter 3. New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 3. And we're picking up in the storyline of life of Jesus. Some things have already happened. He's been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He's already given the Great Commission, which is his mission declaration to his disciples, to go and make disciples. He's already returned to heaven. And two guys, two disciples, Peter and John, who were there on the mountain at the Transfiguration, which we looked at last week, who were down at the bottom of the hill when Jesus interacted with the other nine disciples and said, look, some things don't happen apart from prayer. These two men, having received the Great Commission, are now out fulfilling that. They're telling the story of Jesus. And we're picking up an interaction that takes place as they live in the power and authority of Jesus' name. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 3. I'm going to read from my Bible here. You can follow along on the screen in your note guide or in your own Bible. We're starting with verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now likely, they were going to be part of that prayer time. But now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. What did he ask them for? Money. Money. Now picture this. Here's this dude. He's being carried to the place that he's normally positioned to beg every day. But before he even gets there, while he's still being carried, he sees Peter and John and he asks them for money. He begins to beg. Now, I realize that you and I, as we even drive our cities, can see people on the side of the road with a cardboard sign asking for money in a similar way. And in those spaces, we can actually try to avoid eye contact, either because we're uncomfortable by it, we don't know what to do, we don't have resources to offer, or maybe we're not even sure it's healthy to engage in the way that they're asking. In those spaces, you and I can try to avoid eye contact. But that's not what Peter does. Look in verse 4. Peter looks straight at him as did John. Now, one of the things I love about Scripture is the detail. If we're willing to sit long enough in Scripture, we'll begin to see layers and texture to it that give insight. And one of the realities about John is that he understood the, conne the connection between power and presence of God in prayer. We're going to look at that a little bit later in our time together. But in this space, Peter and John look at this guy, but he is no longer looking at them. Because look at what happens next. He said, then, said, then Peter said, look at us. So this man was no longer looking. I, I don't know if he just did the begging moment with them and now he's on to somebody else. I don't know if he was sheepish, insecure, so he kind of wasn't even looking. I don't know if he was cavalier about it. But what I do know is he wasn't looking and Peter gives him a command to actually look. And so in verse 5, the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. What was he expecting to get? Money. But he had no clue what he would actually get. He asked them for money, but he's about to get and experience something he did not expect. And I'll tell you, there's, there is no indication that this man knew who Peter and John were, who they were, who they served. But I'm going to tell you, he's about to find out. About to find out. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Walk. Literally, get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. 
Then he went with them into the temple courts, praising God, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. My friends, dunamis power of God. The dunamis power of God changes everything, and it's wonderful. But I want you to see something. Catch the key component. In the name of Jesus, we can have that power, and we can give that power. Peter said, I don't have what you're asking for, but what I have, I give. And in the name of Jesus, we can have the dunamis power, and we as ambassadors of Christ can give that power in this life. And that power is transforming. That power is healing. It's life-giving. It's dead man-raising power. It's dunamis power. It's fantastic. But there was a problem here in this moment. See, there were a couple of groups of people, the priests, the temple guard, and the Sadducees, who were not happy with what Peter and John were doing. As we continue to read into chapter 4 of Acts, we get that confirmed. They were not happy with what was happening. Part of that was the Sadducees were a religious group who did not believe in the afterlife or the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife or resurrection at all, which is why they were sad, you see. The Sadducees were sad, you see. Let me tell you why that's funny, people. Now listen, listen, Peter and John were proclaiming a resurrected Lord and an eternal life to be had in him. And these guys didn't like it because they didn't believe in that. So they have him arrested. And it's evening, so they throw him in jail until the next morning. But even in that complexity, the scripture tells us that the number of people who believed in the name of Jesus grew to 5,000. But they spend the night in jail. And the next morning, they're brought before some of the very same people who not long ago condemned Jesus to death. Had to be a bit of a surreal moment. But let's look at what happens in this exchange. We're now in Acts chapter 4, verse 5. We're starting in verse 5, not verse 1. The next day, the rulers, elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. Here it is. By what power, by what dunamis power, or what name did you do this? By what power, or by what name? By by what authority? Who told you to do this? To ask, by what power, or what name, is essentially the same question. In our minds, we may think it's different, but for the people of the day, power resided in a name, and the name represented the authority, which ultimately connected to the who behind it, and the issue of character. Power in the name, by authority, rooted in character. They're connected. If if you and I are going to live in the power of God in our lives, we will have to submit to his authority. We can't reject his authority and think that he will pour out his power. We can't claim his name and identify ourselves in him and reject the authority, eject the character he calls us to as someone who was righteous and pure and holy. If we claim his name and identify ourselves in him, we can experience his power out of his authority that's rooted in his character. It's a significant thing to understand about how the power, the dunamis power of God works in our lives. But let's go back to what's happening in this exchange. Back in Acts chapter Four, verse 8 this time. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. filled with dunamis power, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if, and that's a, that's a big little word right there, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, if, they're saying if, because, it's like, saying, we're saying if because we saw your kangaroo court not long ago with our master Jesus. But if you're really bringing us before you for this reason, if that's the reason, then verse 10, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, by the way, Sadducees who are sad, you see. <laughs> That this man stands 
before you healed. This man, that tells us that dude was present. He didn't go off wandering some other place. He was there in this context. Verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name, no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. You know, I'm pretty sure that this conversation didn't go the way those leaders thought it would go. Because Peter essentially just lets loose with both barrels on them. And he boldly proclaims that it was in Jesus' name. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is how this happened and this took place. The name that has power. The name that comes with authority that's rooted in his character. It is by his name. And he didn't just say that Jesus was a way to be saved. He said Jesus was the only way to be saved. The only way. And in other words, what, what Peter was declaring is that there is no salvation or true significance apart from the name of Jesus. There is no salvation, there's no redemption, there's no rescue, no reconciliation to God apart from the name of Jesus, and there is no true significance in life apart from that same name. It's only in the name of Jesus. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Only in the authority of Jesus' name is dunamis power available. You know, there's a, a Chinese author and pastor named Watchman Nee who led a house church movement in China, and, and he very appropriately and clearly states the reality of this. Here's what he said. No one can be saved without knowing the name of Jesus, and no one can be effectively used of God without knowing the authority of that name. There is no salvation, no true significance apart from the name of Jesus. First century Christians drove out demons in the name of Jesus. First century Christians healed the sick in the name of Jesus. They proclaimed the good news of Jesus where thousands responded and were saved. It was in that name, by his name. And before you write this off as, as something special for Peter and John, or discount it as something for a, 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 an earlier time in history, or, or even just say, you know what, it just doesn't even apply to us today. I want you to consider the words of Jesus as he described for himself his own name. I want to read three passages of scripture all out of the book of John where Jesus describes his own name. I'm not going to add comment around it. I just want you to sit and listen and take in what is often red letter words in the Bible because they're the words of Jesus. So listen as I read them to you. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Ask in my name. Ask in that name, the name, the name that is above all names. It changes everything. It makes all the difference. But hear me, it is. It is not a magic word. It is not a trump card. It is not some emergency lifeline. It's not just a tag or a label or a salutation or a valediction. It is the name. It is his name. And to pray in his name brings to bear the power of God in our lives. Out of a relationship with him. His power in our lives. His name was so significant that John, the disciple John, the same guy who was on the mountain, mountain of the transfiguration, down in the, at the bottom of the hill with Jesus saying to the other nine, look, some things don't happen apart from prayer, who was standing next to Peter looking at the same dude that would be healed in the name of Jesus. That name was so significant that when John wrote the book that bears his name, the book of John, he declares in that a statement for the reason he wrote that entire book. I want to look at it now. Here's what he said. This is why he wrote the book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that you would believe he was who he said he was. 
the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the, read this with me, Bettendorf, if you want to get in, power of his name. That you will have life by the power of his name. Look, I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what kind of problem, pain, loss, hardship, difficulty, betrayal. I don't know what you're facing. But in the power of the name of Jesus, you can overcome. In the power of the name of Jesus, you can find healing and hope. You can have life in the power of the name of Jesus. Dunamis power is available in the authority of Jesus' name. His name is not just letters and syllables. It's not just words or sounds. It is a very representation of the character and the spirit of the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. And there is power in his name, by his authority, rooted in his character for all who come in his name. And one of the cool things about the name of Jesus itself is that God gave Jesus that name. God sent the angel to Joseph, his earthly dad, and said, hey, make sure you name the boy Jesus. And Jesus knew that. In fact, shortly before he's crucified, Jesus is praying, having a conversation with God, and he acknowledges this reality. Here's what he said in prayer with God. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Whose name is it? It's God's name. Who gave it to Jesus? God gave it to Jesus. You gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. Protected and safe by the name that you gave me. Look, to know the name of Jesus is not just to know the word or the letters or the syllables or to know who it's connected to. To know the name of Jesus is to be so positioned in proximity next to him that you are one with him as he was one with the Father. To know him in relationship to seek him in priority, to seek him in persistence with the right posture and position so that you are one with him as he was one with the Father. In that space, the name of Jesus represents the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and the dunamis power and authority of Jesus comes by that name. And he says, pray in that name. Ask in my name. Don't use my name as a magic word, but instead be so close in proximity and relationship to me that you are one with me as I am one with the Father. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the authority of the name of Jesus so that we can cry out. We can can trust in that name. We can pray in that name. And I don't just want to talk about this. I want you to do it. Because when we pray in the name of Jesus, we bring the power of God to bear in our lives out of the relationship that we have with him, and everything begins to change. We bring to bear the power of the one who conquered sin and death. But that only comes by relationship. See, if if you've never stepped into a relationship with God through Jesus, then you're not positioned to live fully into the power and presence of God that's available. It's only when we approach in prayer in the name of Jesus, and under his authority, when we've given Jesus the throne of our heart, and said, hey, be my Lord, be my Savior, rule my life. When we sit in that posture, that position, and we approach in his name by prayer, then the fullness of God's presence and power is available to us. Without Jesus, we'll never experience the fullness of the presence and power of God. But with it, we can. And the way that we experience is to approach in prayer, to to pray. If you've never done it, you can pray right now. And if you don't know what to pray, on the back of your note guide is an example of what you can pray to step into the presence of God and begin to experience his power. Today, right where you're at, you can ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord and begin to experience the presence and power of God like you've never experienced it before. It's the only way this thing works. And I encourage you to do it. Life is way too short and death too certain to live out of fellowship with God.
way too many hard things in life not to be able to intersect the presence and power of God in our lives. So what? Now what? I simply want to put before us a question that we can linger on and process. It's this, whose name defines your life? Whose name defines your life? Is it your name? You may have a really cool name. That's great. There's no power in it, my friends. <laughs> you, may, you may bear the name of your parents and grandparents. You may have been given a beautiful legacy in that, and now you're to carry it forward to future generations. That's, that's great, but there's no power in that. Your legacy that you're receiving in your family may be complicated. It may have some brokenness in it. It doesn't matter if it's a great legacy or a challenging one. There's no power in the family name. You, you may be looking at a, a leader or a spiritual leader and hoping in their name that something's going to happen, but there's no power in their name. There is only power in Jesus' name. And all power rests and resides in his name. So whose name defines your life? I want to invite you to just process that a little more fully. Because when we identify ourselves in Jesus, in his name, he brings healing into our life. He delivers. He gives hope. He reconciles. Satan fears the name of Jesus. And when we live in the name of Jesus, we're more effective in fighting the spiritual battle. We're more effective in, in persevering in complexity and hardship. We're, we're better in our relationships with people, in, in our engaging with other people. We're even better positioned to approach God in our own relationship and asking of him. In his name, that's possible. By the authority of Jesus' name, all things are possible in his dunamis power. But his power is only available in the authority of Jesus' name. Look, I want to invite you to take a moment to listen to one of our church family, to hear how the dunamis power of God intersected in their life as, as she identified herself in Jesus. So I invite you to sit back and listen to Melanie's resurrection story. My name is Melanie Putnam, and 10 years ago, I had something really crazy happen to me. A myelin woman's diagnosed with a rare lung disease, one of just several hundred women with it in the United States. Um, I was pregnant with my second son, Josiah, and I, I believe I was about 19 weeks pregnant, and went to the doctor and found out that I was having some breathing trouble. They thought maybe I had asthma, so I ended up going to a pulmonary specialist in Iowa City and found out that I had have one of the rarest forms of lung disease called lymphangioleomyomatosis. And it's basically where these smooth muscle cells enter into your lung cavity and basically eat your lung tissue. So um, there ended up coming a day where I ended up in respiratory failure. I was home with the kids and I, I, what had happened is one of my lungs had collapsed. The boys went and got the neighbor. The neighbor called the police and the ambulance and they ended up airlifting me to Iowa City. And I lived in the Iowa City Hospital for three to four months. And basically I was too sick to go home so I would either die there or um, if, if God blessed me with um, a set of lungs that would fit me and my body in time, then I would survive that way. My husband stayed in the room with me for all those months and the kids were with our family and stuff. And it was just very hard for me as their mom, just wanting to be a mom and I couldn't do that anymore. The night before I got my transplant, I told my husband that I don't want to wake up tomorrow. I, I don't want to live this life anymore. The next morning, I just woke up with such a sense of peace, just kind of like the peace that surpasses all understanding that day. It was really cool. It was, really, it was, it was totally a God moment. Oh, 
So far I've been doing really well. I'm actually at seven years, which is way past what they expected for me. Um, and I'm doing pretty well. I have little issues here and there. So I take upwards of 50 to 70 pills every day to suppress my immune system so that my body doesn't realize I have a foreign organ. I do have a form of rejection. My body has now developed antibodies that are recognizing that I do have a foreign organ. So the chemotherapy is to try to suppress those. It's like every day I wake up and I'm like, oh, I'm here another day. That's so awesome and I feel so happy about it. And now my husband and I do uh, Go Kids. We teach fifth and sixth graders and I absolutely love it. When I woke up that day in the hospital and it was quiet and peaceful and I didn't have that air blowing in my nose anymore, I had such a hope in Jesus because I knew that now I had the rest of my life and I had time after that. I take every day to tell my kids and my husband I love them a million times a day. And I do everything I can today because I don't know if I'm gonna have tomorrow. And that includes everything in my life, you know, go kids. I make sure that every kid that I come in contact with at Go Kids knows that I love them and I want to do everything I can to make an impression on their lives. And everybody should live that way. Nobody, nobody is promised tomorrow. Not me, not you, nobody is. I'm so overwhelmed all the time with God's generosity that I still get to be here. And I still get to do the things that I really want to do. My name is Melanie Putnam. And this is my resurrection story. Whose name defines your life? You know, there's beauty and brokenness in Melanie's story. There's beauty in God's provision, in extended time, in the fact her joy is made complete, peace that passes understanding, but there's brokenness in the complexity and the burden she still carries and in all that that is. And I encourage you to pray for Melanie and her family. But what I hope you see most in this resurrection story is that Melanie has identified herself in Jesus. His name defines her life. Not the pain and the hardship and the complexity, but Jesus. Jesus gives her strength, power, hope, to make the most of every opportunity in the days that God gives because she has identified herself in him. Whose name defines your life? Again, I don't know what kind of pain or problem, loss or hardship you're facing, but whatever it is, Jesus is more than able to help you overcome, to empower and strengthen you to walk in joy and peace and all the complexity. We are more than conquerors in him. When we identify ourselves in him, take on his name, he heals, he gives hope, he delivers, he strengthens, he rescues, he gives second chances. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength, who gives us dunamis power. By the authority of Jesus' name, all things are possible in dunamis power. You know, last week I laid out a, a challenge. I challenged you to pray every day for 29 days straight, asking God to equip you and empower you with his dunamis power, to move, to heal, to set free, to offer those I can't moments to him. And if you, take, if you took that challenge and you've been doing it, awesome, I celebrate it. I want to encourage you to continue in it. Some of you may have already seen God respond. If you've not yet seen that, continue to lean into the right posture and position to see him move. If you weren't here to get that challenge, I want to Lay the challenge out for you today. Start with 22 days, but begin to ask God to pour out his dunamis power and equip and empower you for what he's called you to, what you're in. It's not about the number of days. It's about the posture and the pursuit of him, chasing him. In fact, just as a, again, as a word of caution and reminder to never seek his power more than his presence or to seek his power without his presence. We can come boldly before God in the name of Jesus in prayer and we will experience his presence and we can receive his power. But make sure you're not seeking his power more than his presence 
Make sure you're not seeking the results or the answers or the resolution more than you're seeking him. It won't work. This only works when we've come in the name, the power and authority of the name of Jesus in prayer, out of the right posture, in the right position of humbly before him, with persistence and priority to it, that we experience his presence and he imparts his power. That's how it happens. And when you do that, let him define your life. Let his name define your life. Let him define your prayers and watch what he does. You know, one of the things about prayer and approaching in the name of Jesus, it's only in the proximity of Jesus that being on our knees is a place of power. Most of the time the world looks and sees being on our knees or being, someone being on their knees as vulnerability, as weakness, submission. But in proximity to Jesus, that is a place of power. That's a place of anointing. It's the place that God meets us and pours out his power. So what I wanna do is actually end our time today in some prayer. And I encourage you to take whatever posture you wanna take. If you wanna stand and raise your hand and hands in prayer and praise, go for it. If you wanna turn around in your seat and kneel there, you wanna lean forward in your seat, whatever you wanna do, take whatever posture you're comfortable with, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kneel right here on this platform. And I want to end our time in prayer by praying a prayer that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. So I invite you to move however you want to go. I'm going to lean down here and we're going to end our time in prayer, praying this specific prayer. Because when we come in proximity to Jesus, that's a place of power. It's a place that he moves. And we take on his name and his identity. So I invite you to pray with me. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power, dunamis power, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his dunamis power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.